we have Flavio and Sergey on the line who will be going over their project updates from Juno to Kilo and anything else that they, may, that they think would be relevant for our users and operators out there. So today, we're going to kick it off with Flavio who will be providing the updates for OpenStack messaging. So, Flavio, whenever you're ready. Hey, thanks, Alison. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I'm Flavio Perkok, I'm the current PDL for uh, the OpenStack messaging program. Um, also, codename is Zakar, or Zakar, I don't even know how to pronounce it, honestly. And, well, as it has already been said, well, we're just going to go through the kilo plans that we kind of discussed uh, back in Paris uh, at the summit. So, uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, before, before we even get started with uh, the kilo plans, uh, I'd like to take a little bit, and a few minutes of time, and explain what um, Zakar actually is. And, and before I get, uh, like, before you even ask what Zakar means or where the name comes from, um, the name is actually a the name of, of, of how uh, Mesopotamians, uh, like in the Mesopotamian mythology, uh, there were some messengers for the god of sin, and those messenger uh, provided those messages through nightmares and dreams and uh, to, uh, to people. And obviously the relation uh, with the name is about the nightmares and not exactly about the messaging part. Um, so uh, that's where the name comes from. It is Zakhar. Uh, we had to change the name. The project was, pre was previously called Marconi. And, and there were some issues related to the name, and, and we were basically forced to, to change it. And, and this is what we came, what we came up with. Um, so uh, now that I've said this, uh, let's get to, to something more technical in the next slide. Um, so 101 about Zucker. Uh, Zucker is uh, like a really protocol. I already said, like Zucker is the messaging service for uh, OpenStack. Uh, it's not the only one. There are other solutions for different areas. Uh, the key thing about uh, Docker is that it is a data API. It has a data API. That's what it provides. Uh, it doesn't provide any provisioning API. Uh, and it provides messaging, um, messaging features and solutions for um, different uh, messaging patterns. And, and obviously, it wants to be easily scalable and, and, and easy to maintain and, and provide all the Python libraries that are needed uh, to interact with the service. And if you are familiar with other uh, vendors, uh, Zucker would be something similar to either Q service or even uh, AWS, SQS, and SNS put together. So um, when I say put together, it's because when you read messaging in, in Zucker's description, uh, which, by the way, what I put in that slide is actually a mission statement that we have in the governance report. Uh, when you read messaging there, we are actually referring to um, not just uh, the ability to send and receive messages, but also the ability to uh, have notifications, uh, different kind of notifications. And that, that's actually something that we will be working on during Kilo, and I think it's the next point in, in the next slide. Um, so yeah, we, we can move to the next slide now. So notifications. Um, there are a few things that no, first one. Um, so th there are a few things that we actually want to work on in, in Kilo, and, and we we were like we tried a lot to do, keep the list like small because uh, in previous summits uh, we we came along with uh, we came up with uh, many ideas and many things we wanted to work on, and obviously time is is limited, and and we. We kind of went through uh, all the feedback we have gotten so far from the community and, and different discussions on the mailing list, and, and we decided to take really like very few things and work on those. And there are two main features that we want to work on. Um, so there are brand new features that we want to have in the service during Kilo. One of those is notifications. Uh, like I said, uh, Zucker aims to provide notifications as well. So. We're going to go ahead and implement these as part of the new version of the API. We will add notifications so you will be able to subscribe to the service in many different ways. And we're not talking about notifications in a way like you would probably get them from writing queues so that you would just uh, connect to the server and get notifications, uh, messages basically pushed uh, back to the client library. But we also like to have different kind of notifications like 
sorry, like pushing um, um, messages through a mobile APNs, uh, emails, uh, even SMS or text messages. And, but I mean, that, that's far in the future and the things that the two publishers that we want to focus on uh, for, for the killer release are actually webhooks. So you would subscribe some URL to the service and when a message, um, and you will, so you will actually subscribe to a queue, so a specific uh, queue or topic if you will. Um, and so when messages get there, uh, you will get them in, in that URL that you have subscribed. Or you can also get those messages back to the client if you have a um, connection to the server um, or persistent connection, which actually takes us to, to the next thing we want to implement, and I think it is in the next slide. Um, so uh, yeah, persistent transport. Uh, this is something that we currently not ha don't have. Um, so Docker is pretty much, I hate this word, but I'm going to use it anyway. It's actually pluggable. So you can create different plugins from, for different parts of the service. And we have this pluggability uh, in the storage side and the transport side of the service. Um, for the transport side, though, uh, we don't have any plugin besides the one we support right now, which is HTTP. And, and that basically means that if you want to talk to the service, you have to use an HTTP client and you have to send message, HTTP messages, uh, requests to the service and to the server and it will process it for you. And something we want to have definitely is the ability to connect to the server and keep that connection alive so that you don't have to, uh, so you can basically uh, work around the burden uh, related to HTTP and, and the overhead of, of the protocol, uh, which it might be low, but it, it still exists. So we want to have the ability to connect to the server and have that persistent connection there. And something that we also want to have is uh, better support for browsers. And therefore, we have chosen um, WebSocket as the protocol we will use for the first implementation of a persistent transport. And WebSocket is, I mean, it has been around for, for quite a few years already. I'm not going to say, any, I'm not even going to say like a long time, but it had been around for quite a few years. Uh, there have been uh, different, many iterations over uh, the specification of the protocol and, and, and where uh, it is being supported by most of the mainstream browsers uh, nowadays. So we, we wanted to, to have something that uh, is cross browsers and, and it can be used by, by many people from the browser. And the, I mean, in addition to that, I mean, WebSocket can also be used outside the browser. If you have a WebSocket library for you, uh, preferred language, uh, you, could use, you could use that library and talk to um, Docker using a WebSocket transport. And that's something we'll actually do uh, in, in the Docker client. Uh, we will have support for WebSocket from there as well. And it will uh, hopefully, I mean, type of meeting, it will do something fancy like falling back to different protocols based on what's available in, in, in the server. Um, so, and, and implementing this persistent transport will also require us to have a kind of a different implementation of, of our current protocol or current API. Uh, so the API in terms of actions won't change at all, but it will change in terms of uh, form because it will be kind of, uh, for the persistent transport, for the WebSocket transport, it will kind of convert it into something that is serial, serializable and that can be sent through a, a WebSocket. So we will kind of uh, translate what we have in the HTTP transport into um, some kind of dictionary or something like that uh, that we will be able to send to the server through WebSockets. Um, so that, that's probably the gist of, of, of this work here. And um, I'm very keen on, on, on what we're doing here. So looking forward to have it uh, ready. And so we can now move to the next slide. Can we move to the next slide? Okay. Um, the other thing we want to uh, work on is uh, storage capabilities. Uh, storage capabilities is not uh, it. So uh, we have the, all this uh, pluggability, and like I said, we have this pluggability in the storage side as well, and, and we are able to. Uh, I mean, you can write your own uh, storage driver and, and use it from Docker, and but. This storage driver currently has to support every single feature supported by the uh, current built-in storage drivers that we have. And we want to make this layer more flexible so that other people can implement their own storage driver that don't have to necessarily live in our code base. 
Uh, and those drivers can surface uh, their, um, these people uh, needs depending on, on what they want to do. So in order to do that, we need to convert all the features that we have currently in our sort of driver into something called capabilities that we will expose through these storage capabilities. Um, and, and we will expose those uh, in the API through flavors. And these capabilities basically are um, a way to, for the driver to say uh, the things uh, supported in it. And for example, um, a driver may opt out from supporting claims or it may opt out to support uh, for supporting uh, FIFO, uh, depending on what technology it is sitting on. And it may also, it may also opt out from supporting uh, durability and in favor of more uh, of a higher throughput, for example. Um, and this is actually the base uh, feature that we need to have in order to implement uh, the next one that we have online. Um, if you want, you, you can move to the next slide now. And yeah, so the next one that we have in line is actually uh, optional FIFO. And, and I mean, the previous one was a, a, a basically the basis to, for, for implementing this. Because um, so something that we have discussed um, at the very beginning when we started working on, on Dakar, uh, like I said, uh, at, the time, uh, at the time it was called Marconi. Uh, when, when we started working on it, we got some feedback uh, from the community. And, and something that the community said to us is that, FIFO, not having FIFO in services like SQS was actually, a, was actually very painful. So we heard their feedback and we wanted to have full support and like 100% guarantee of FIFO in the service. Um, and, and we did that and we have, a, we currently, the current released version has a full support for FIFO, but it turns out that FIFO has uh, there are two issues basically related to FIFO. The first one, and it's not, I mean, it's not bad itself, but there are some things related. The first one is that there's some overhead related to FIFO, depending on the storage driver. You would have to do some magic to actually guarantee 100% uh, ordering. And some, some technologies may have it uh, built in, others don't. So you may have to uh, do some workarounds and hack it somewhere, somehow in the driver. And along that line, there are some uh, technologies that won't support it at all, which is the second issue that we have. And since there, since there are very valuable and good technologies out there that may be a good fit for, uh, for a Zucker storage driver, uh, we don't want them to, uh, to have to pay the price of, a, of, some, of something that we have chosen as a need for, for, for the service. So after hearing uh, the latest feedback that we got from, uh, from our community, from the OpenSight community, uh, we decided to make FIFO optional, optional and, and it will depend on the driver itself and, and, and how it is configured. And you can basically opt in or opt out from having FIFO in a pair deployment uh, basis, basically. Uh, so this is on something that's definitely coming in, in Kilo as well. Um, we can now move to, uh, to the next slide. Well, we're basically going almost at the end of, of my presentation. I don't think I'll, I'll use the whole 15 minutes um, or probably already used them. Um, can we move to the next slide? Okay, perfect. So keys to topics. Uh, this is something that we haven't decided yet. Uh, so time permitting, uh, we, we would like to, um, if, if, if we have enough time, we would like to uh, rename or, or what we have right now called queues. We would like to move from having queues to uh, something called topics and stop having a first citizen resource that we need to create in the database. This is just a pure optimization from an inter uh, for Docker internally so that we can save space in, in the storage. So, so there are technologies that need to have uh, the, the queue resource created, they can still create it. Uh, but if there's no need to do that, like uh, the MongoDB one that we have or even the Redis one, you can just skip and, and don't create it at all. And, and we would like to do this, uh, like switch from, from queues to topics, which would be like a more lightweight uh, resource to have. In, in the service, but this hasn't decided. This hasn't been decided yet. So 
um, it may or may not happen um, before uh, the next relief. We can now move uh, to the next one. So uh, I think that's pretty much it. If we go back to April 2015, uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have a release that has notifications, uh, persistent transport uh, storage capabilities, and optional FIFO. And well, the dot down there is because prioritizing things is actually harder than time traveling. So things might be moved to the next release, or some other things may come into this one here. So at uh, the high level, this is what we would like to do. Uh, no promises made. Uh, we will hopefully have all these and more, but we'll see. And we will move to the next slide. Uh, this is a story yet, I mean, to be continued and, and yet to be told. Uh, we'll see what happens in the next release. But if you have any other questions or you would like to join and help and, and uh, with anything and you're interested in the project, please, we're all at openstack-docker at freenode. And I'm Flavio Percocco, as already said. My email is flavio at redhat.com. And I'm flapper 87 on IRC and Twitter if you have any more questions. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Flavio. And again, we'll have the, his contact information and a link to the um, IRC um, in the description for the YouTube video. So if you do want to get involved or have any questions at all for Flavio, please feel free to reach out and get involved any way that you can. So also today we do have Sergey who will be going over the updates for OpenStack data processing. Sergey, whenever you're ready, go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Sergey Lukyanov. I'm uh, the program technical lead for OpenStack Data Processing Program, uh, code name Sahara. And uh, so I'd like to make a short overview of the project and some highlights of the uh, things done during the June release and some plans for the Q1. So Sahara provides a scalable data processing stack uh, and management interfaces. Uh, and it includes two main directions. Uh, the first one is the provisioning and uh, operations for data processing clusters like Hadoop, Spark, Storm clusters. And uh, the second direction is uh, about scheduling and operating data processing jobs and workloads on top of clusters provisioned uh, by the first part of the project. So EDP itself uh, is a uh, it has a Sahara stake on data processing for flow management. And uh, uh, right now, it's a, a very pliable mechanism that uh, makes users able to implement their own workload managers for different data processing clusters or use some existing ones like Uzi for Hadoop. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, uh, for now, we are using uh, Apache Uzi for uh, managing workloads on uh, top of Hadoop clusters. And we're using the Spark Manager for Spark clusters. And uh, there is no actually the workload managers for Storm, but uh, probably will make some. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, we can see some stats uh, for the general release. Uh, the main difference uh, between this and previous releases is that Sahara has been uh, officially included to the integrated OpenStack release in June. And uh, so we already uh, see very good growth of number of contributors and contributions itself. Uh, so more info could be found on uh, the Launchpad page for Sahara. And uh, let's move on to the next slide, and uh, uh, let's talk a bit about the uh, uh, main changes uh, happened on the Sahara project during the Juno cycle. Uh, firstly, we moved to the specs uh, process for new features instead of following blueprints. I mean, not just instead, but in addition to following blueprints. So right now, we are using specifications for mostly all the new features that 
uh, will be added uh, in Sahara, and uh, it works good enough for now. So the next uh, thing that was done during the Juno cycle is uh, that Sahara dashboard that was previously maintained and developed in the separated uh, Git repository uh, has been completely merged into Horizon. Uh, uh, and uh, now it's available out of the box in Horizon installations. And this will be enabled automatically if the report sync endpoint available in the Keystone services catalog. Uh, so uh, the next thing, as I already said before, is a plausible framework agnostic EDP mechanism. So the last data processing now done uh, without any hard-coded uh, approach. And uh, in fact, uh, the new plugin could be written for uh, Sahara to implement the uh, data processing cloud supervisioning and uh, starting from junior release, uh, uh, such uh, one more plugin could be written to support running workloads on top of clusters. So right now we could support, uh, in theory, any data processing clusters by Sahara. And uh, we're going to implement uh, some new plugins from new and uh, popular data processing frameworks. Uh, so talking about the uh, uh, change done in uh, Juna about the supported uh, distributions and the processing frameworks, uh, the next slide is about it. So uh, we started supporting the 2.4 branch of vanilla Apache Hadoop in June release, uh, and uh, the brand new plugin has been added to support Cobra distribution of Apache Hadoop uh, for the whole file.x branch. And we started supporting Spark, uh, the reporting framework too, in addition to the Hadoop. And uh, it was the first uh, non-Hadoop plugin uh, that was done for Sahara. And the uh, whole plugin mechanism approach has been very good tested and blessed by adding this new plugin because Spark is absolutely a different thing. Uh, so the next uh, feature and change that has been done during the Juno cycle was an uh, addition of uh, Solometer notifications. So now we're reporting uh, change for the reporting cluster statuses to Solometer and we can uh, uh, now fetch and statistics from Solometry about the uh, cluster's life cycle. Okay, uh, during the June cycle, we implemented uh, a bunch of resources uh, for heat, uh, and uh, it includes ability to create uh, not group and cluster templates for Sahara using heat resources, and to create a Sahara cluster itself. So uh, the first uh, interaction of Sahara that is about uh, provisioning data ports and clusters is now fully available from the heat side. So you can write um, the heat stack that will include some of your resources, and uh, you can uh, add uh, uh, a few resources to deploy the Hadoop cluster with uh, hundreds of nodes, for example. Okay, uh, and uh, the last big change that has been done in Juno is the uh, security group support edition and especially edition for auto security groups creation. So for now, Sahara automatically create, uh, Sahara is able to create uh, automatically uh, security groups for data ports and clusters that will open uh, ports uh, only between nodes that uh, need to communicate and uh, to open uh, uh, some ports to the public network uh, only on the nodes that need to have uh, um, to be accessed from the internet. Uh, so let's let's take a look on a Kilo plans. Uh, we're going to support new versions for all of the existing plugins, including new version uh, so support for the. New Hadoop 2.6 that has been released uh, 
wrote a week ago. Uh, it will be added to Cloudera distribution of Hadoop plugin, which is a hot and rock data processing uh, data, data platform, and uh, uh, to our vanilla plugin that is a uh, implementation of uh, provisioning um, of upstream Hadoop, uh, not not from some of the vendor distribution. Uh, in addition, we are going to have the uh, Apache Storm plugin support. Uh, it's already uh, merged uh, yesterday to Sahara, so already supporting one more data processing framework. Uh, and the Apache Storm is a real-time uh, messaging uh, processing service. So it makes users able to process some messages like a Twitter uh, uh, queries uh, and etc. Uh, the next one is the dashboard UX improvements. Uh, and uh, it includes uh, some things like adding filtering to the different pages, uh, adding some the wizards to make the process of creation the processing frameworks a bit easier than it's now. Um, the next point is about uh, better heat integration. It's mostly related to uh, upgrading our internal mechanism of working with heat to the latest version of heat templates, uh, including uh, hot. Uh, and uh, the last point is about ironic support. It's mostly about uh, checking that everything is working okay with ironic and uh, uh, supporting building uh, uh, pre-installed images uh, for ironic with uh, uh, installed data processing frameworks. And we are going to support uh, very important use case of provisioning uh, hybrid clusters with uh, part of the cluster on hardware machines and part of the cluster on virtual machines. For example, to provide users the ability to deploy some permanent part of the cluster on hardware and uh, to provision on demand, uh, for example, compute capacity uh, on virtual machines. Okay, so uh, I think that's all uh, from me uh, for the hair update. Uh, so, if you'd like uh, to connect us, uh, if you have some questions, you can always find us on the OpenStack-Sahara channel on Freenode or OpenStack-Dev uh, at uh, least the OpenStack.org mailing list. Uh, and uh, some more uh, contact points will be added on the YouTube video description. Thank you for your attention. Awesome. Thank you, Sergey, um, for your time. And like he said, those links will be available in the YouTube description. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or you would like to learn more about either of these projects. Thank you.